those things. Uh, our scripture reading today is found in Luke chapter 12, verse 16 through 21. Luke chapter 12, verse 16 through 21. And I want to tell you this story about a parable that Jesus uh, uh, shared once uh, in the scripture. The Bible says Jesus told them a story. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. He said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. Then he said, I know. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Sounds like a bright idea, right? <laughs> then I'll have room enough to store all my wheat and other goods. And I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now, take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. You will die this very night. Then who will get everything you have worked for? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth but not have a rich relationship with God. It's only fitting that today I speak to you under the subject, the final play. You only get one shot. Let us pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we are grateful and thankful for the privilege and the honor of being in the house of God today. And Father, I'm simply asking that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart will be acceptable in your sight and encouraging to your people. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Let all the people of God who believe say amen, amen. and amen. The final play. Listen, saints, I want to get into this word today, uh, and I want to begin with uh, this, this concept of the final play, the final play. Uh, what I'm referring to here is uh, the last part of a game, right? The last part of a game where you're talking about football or baseball or, uh, or soccer or, or basketball, any part of the game, in my humble opinion, I love the games. I love, I love it when the game comes down uh, to the final play. I hate to watch a blowout. Right? When I'm, I'm talking about team, your, your, especially when it's your team, right? Your team just getting destroyed. You don't want to see that anymore. How many of you have been watching the game before of your team and it was so bad, they were losing so bad, you just turn the TV off? Or you just get up and leave because this, this is terrible. Right? So, so, so I, I just love it. I, and I don't... I don't I don't even care if I know who the teams are. Know about You don't even have to be my favorite team. or If it's two teams playing the game, I want it to be competitive all the way down to the wire because I, I just love the pressure of that moment. I just like that. right? Maybe it's the competition in me. right? I just love when it comes down to the final play. And so you have, these, you have, you have had these moments that have been, become classical moments in sports history. So, for example, this was the final play when the New England Patriots was playing against the Seattle Seahawks. Any Seattle Seahawks fans in the house? Are you still heartbroken? Yes. You still have any anxiety? Yes. When they down at the goal line, how do you not give the ball to the beast? They mess around and throw a pass on the goal line when you got this guy named Marshawn Lynch on your team. That's all you got to do. But they threw a pass. And Malcolm Butler went down in Super Bowl history because of how he, how he executed on the final play. Can I give you another one? Uh, this one, this one, this one. I don't even want to show this. I, 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 Lord Jesus, help me. <sighs> take a deep breath. I'm going to take a deep breath right here. Listen, listen, listen. I was born and raised in Alabama. 
And, oh, man. Now, forget Clemson, man. Nobody would care about no Clemson, man. Listen, we got bigger fish to, fish to fry than Clemson. But this, 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 this game right here, this was an iron bowl. When we decided to kick a field goal, Alabama that is. We decided to kick a field goal, and it was about three seconds left on the clock. Kicked the field goal. Now, it was one second left on the clock, right? And Coach Nick Saban argued down. One second left. One sec. Give us our one second. Put the one second on the clock. Send the field goal unit out there. Kick the field goal, and it came up short. And this knucklehead right here. The back of the end zone, catch the ball. Man, I'm getting sad right now. I don't even want to preach no more, man. Take it all the way back to the house. Touchdown. Man, we were in South Carolina. We were in South Carolina. We were watching that. Anyway, <laughs> so so so, but 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 you know, let, let me bring you up to speed, right? Let, let let's let's switch sports for a minute, right? You had one that happened in 2019 that went down in history as well, right? Basketball wise, this was when Kawhi Leonard drove to the baseline. And pulled up, and he shot the ball. This is him right here. I just love it, right? And the ball bounced four times on the rim. <laughs> four times on the rim. Gave him, enough to, uh, gave him enough time to squat down. He looking to see whether or not it's going to go in. And the ball went in, and Canada went crazy. Right? Went on to win the... Uh, NBA title, NBA championship, uh, because of how he executed on the final play, right? But if you want to boil it down to the greatest final play of all in the history of basketball, it has to be the one that happened 21 years ago. I got some witnesses in the house. See, see, this is this is why this is why this is why the younger generation. I, I remember this. Uh, I, this hit me this morning. This is why the younger generation have no idea about what greatness is really about. See, see, listen, listen. They, they, they still have the, uh, the, the, the unmitigated gall yes. Yes. to think that LeBron James is the greatest of all time. But I get it, though. This happened in 1998. They weren't even born. They weren't even born. They weren't born, Doc. So they don't know no better. They don't know no better, man. They don't know no better. See, I'm the preacher. I can get up here and say what I want to say about Michael Jordan, LeBron James. I'm preaching right now. You sitting down. You get your church and you get your little platform and you can talk about... But as for me in this house, yeah, yeah. we declare it's Michael Jordan. Listen, 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 listen. Real talk, real talk, real talk. I want you to get this, right? I want you to get this. I want you to get this. When you think about final plays, I had to ask myself the question, what makes the final play special? What, what? What makes the final play so, so much of a big deal? To the point now where players are measured not by what they do during the regular season. Not by, not by what they do during the first quarter, the second quarter, or the third quarter. But it's when it all boils down to the final play. Why is that? Here's why. Here's why. I just got my two reasons why. Number one, I believe it has to do with the pressure of the moment. 
the pressure of the moment. In other words, you know, your team is down, right? You're losing or the game is tied. And, and, and if you win this game, you get the chance to advance and go on to play for a more significant game. Oh, you hear what I'm saying, right? So the pressure of the moment can create this atmosphere, create this environment, create this situation that if the player steps up, then a hero is made. Not only that, but sometimes it's also the difficulty of the shot. So you've got the pressure of the moment and the difficulty of the shot. This makes for a special, this makes for a special kind of player. This is where the, 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 the Steph Curry's are born. This is where the MJs uh, create their legacy. This is why Kobe Bryant is so special. This is why LeBron James is so special. This is why Tom Brady is so special. Because in the moments where it matters, in the moments where the tough, where, where, where the time is very difficult, hear me now, in the moments where it's hard, where it's where, where where adversity is present, it is in these moments that a player is defined. So what that you do a lot of winning or, or, or you score a lot of points during the regular season? So what, so what that you perform great when there's no pressure? When everything is all good, when everything is all easy, so what? Every, you, you, you're supposed to do well in the time of ease. But I believe the thing that makes the final plays count or makes them so special is because of the pressure of the moment and the difficulty of the time. And I stopped by to tell you today that there is a connection between the final plays and the final days. There's a connection between the final plays and the final days. And this is a connection that you ought to be interested in. If you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, you ought to be interested. Why? Because the disciples in Matthew 24 and verse 3, they had a keen interest in the last days or the final plays. They asked Jesus, the Bible says, the disciples came to Jesus privately. Tell us, Jesus, they said, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? They're curious now. They want to know now. And watch what Jesus says. Jesus says that I want you first and foremost to watch out that no one deceives you. Before Jesus began to list these things that you need to be aware of, the first thing Jesus says that in the final days, when it all boils down, there will be a lot of lies going forth. I need you to be aware that you're not deceived and know the truth. And watch this, watch this. Paul picks this thing up in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1 through 3. Paul says, you should know this, that in the last days, there will be very difficult times. There will be an atmosphere that has a lot of pressure. It's going to be very challenging for you to live your life in a way that is pleasing to God. In the last days, in the final days, there will be a difficult time. Well, what does that time look like, Brother Paul? I'm glad you asked, he said. Watch this, watch this. He says, for people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. Now, let me tell you something that warmed my heart yesterday, especially in light of this verse right here. I saw two young men who were attending the final play. Two of them, two young men who were attending the final play. I saw them sitting in the stands, you know, talking, having dialogue. And then when I walked, I, I, and then when I walked, I had to go uh, outside of the fence, and I was having a conversation with, uh, with, with with Russ. Shout out to Russ and his security team. I had a conversation with Russ, and as I'm talking to Russ, I see these same two gentlemen go to the other side of the street, right, cross over into the uh, the, the, the the parking lot, not the parking lot, but the side with the sidewalk across the street over here. And these two young men were smoking a cigarette. And then they came back over after they finished smoking a cigarette. And so I go up to them and I say, hey, man, I, see, I, saw, that you, I saw you guys over there smoking a cigarette, man. 
uh, uh, and, and, and I asked them why they do that. Now, they, were surpr- they, they didn't know what I was saying. Was smoking cigarettes is wrong or they trying to figure out what's going on. But what they don't know is that I'm, I'm, I'm affirming them, I'm encouraging them. And I said to them, I said, man, you know, uh, you, walk across, you walk across there. I'm assuming you walked across there because you didn't want to disrespect this house of God. And they said, yeah, man, you know, you know, you know respect, man. No, no, absolutely. And so I'm like, praise God, man. I ain't say nothing about no cigarettes. You missed you just you missed what I just said. <laughs> Hallelujah. Jesus said, the, the, the word of God says, uh, the next verse it says, look, they will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. This is a description of the last days. Here's the worst part. They will be, watch this, they will betray their friends, be reckless, too puffed up uh, with pride, and love pleasure more than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that can make them godly. He is describing, hear me, saints of God, he is describing what people will be like, what the world will be like in the last days. But here's what you have to understand. Paul is not concerned in this writing with the world's behavior. Paul is giving a description of the church. He's saying that this is what the church, this is what the so-called people of God will act like, will think like, will behave like in the final days. And then he says, stay away from people like that. We are indeed living in some difficult times. We're living in a time where our nation is divided. We're living in a time where people are creating race wars, pitting one race against the other race. We are living in a time where police brutality is not necessarily something that's new. It's simply the fact that we have cameras and we can see it more now. We're living in a time where it's not just the police that are killing uh, folk. It's not just, hear me now, not, it's not just uh, 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 the people against the police department or people against police officers. But the reality is, is that we've got issues in our own communi- community with us killing ourselves. I can't get no amen on that one. Can I I tell you something? Can I tell you something? Look, I believe with all my heart that we as a people, uh, people of color in particular, and everybody else who agree with the fact that we need to come up with legislation that will hold police officers accountable. We need to uh, rewrite laws. We need to push for programs. We need every last one of these things. But we also, at the same time as we're fighting that particular end, we also need to be in our communities and trying to create situations that we can, get, we can stop all the killing that's happening amongst one another. You see, more often than not, we are, we are saying that it's one or the other. More often than not, we're saying that, hey, you know, and, and we go crazy. We go bananas when a police officer kills a black person. But I need us to keep that same energy. Keep that same energy when it's happening from, between one another. We can do both. We can, we can cook and bake at the same time. Yeah, we can chew and walk at the same time. Oh, you hear what I'm saying? And so uh, at, uh, at some point, at some point, at some point, our communities have to take that sense of personal responsibility and ownership of the issues that are happening. Because at the end of the day, look, I, I don't care who's in the White House. If Joe Biden is in the White House, if Donald Trump, if Donald Trump is in the White House, if, if, if Hillary Clinton is in the White House, I don't care who is in the White House. At the end of the day, uh, 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 the person in the White House is not going to stop the young man on the corner with a gun in his hand looking to go rob somebody. That's up to the church. 
That's up to the people in the community. And so we have to ask ourselves, as believers, as Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ, we have to ask ourselves, uh, in, in light of this, right, in light of this, in light of what Jesus said also in Matthew 24 and verse 12, Jesus says, there will be in the last days, there will be an increase of wickedness. The love of most will grow cold. But watch this, he says, but the one who endures to the end, the one who can last in the fourth quarter, That's right. That's right. the one who can execute when the game is on the line, yeah. will be saved. Amen. So how does that happen, though, right? How does that happen? How does, how does someone who says, I want to live my life for God, I want to execute in the end, I want to be able to uh, perform well, and I want to I, I have a, a, a phenomenal uh, final play. When the ball is in my hand, I want to make sure that I deliver. How do we do that? Well, I go to, I, I go to one of my childhood heroes uh, who went by the name of, or goes by the name of Allen Iverson, or you may call him the answer. Uh, he says something about how he plays his game, and I think that there's something here for us. Hey, I said, listen, I play every game game like it's my last game. All that matters is that you go out there and play every game as if it was your last. And my question for us today is how to live every day like it's your final play. How to live every single day like it's your final play. Let's go to our text that we just read this morning in Luke chapter 12, verse 16 through 21. And as we read that text, I want to pull out just three principles that I believe we need to live that, that will help us live every day like it's our final play. And the first lesson that I want to gather from this particular passage of Scripture is this, real simple. We need to live with greater self-awareness. We need to live with greater self-awareness. Well, what do I mean by greater self-awareness? Let me help you uh, uh, with this, right? So, 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 so self-awareness is something uh, that, 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 that J.R. Smith didn't have a couple of years ago. You see, you see, you see as, you, as you look at this image right here, uh, you will see uh, uh, the leader on the team, uh, LeBron James, uh, pointing in a direction uh, that, 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 that J.R. Smith, who has the ball, should be going. You see, you see the, the ball was shot, he got the rebound, and he ran in the opposite direction. This is a horrible final play, by the way. He was given an opportunity with the rebound. But he ran the wrong way. You got the captain of the team saying, listen, boy, this way, I'm trying to help somebody, this way is the right way. This is the way walkie in it. But you going the wrong way. There's somebody in the house of God today. God has been telling you for a long time, this is the way. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the Bible says that way leads to death. This is the way. Now watch this. Watch this. He's going the wrong way. Help him, Jesus. He's going the wrong way. Why is he going the right, wrong way? Because he's not aware of the time on the clock, he's not aware of the opportunity at hand. He's not, he has very low self-awareness. Just like, watch this, watch this. And, and look, 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 look at LeBron. Like, bro, oh my Lord, Jesus. Watch this, watch this, watch this. This Jesus. And that's you. This Jesus right here. And that's me. And you like, what? I, I, oh, my. Um, low awareness. 
or sometimes no awareness. Just like this man in this picture, in, in, in the scripture. Watch this. Look at what he says, guys. He says, look, Jesus told a story about this rich man, fertile farm, produce a lot of crops, right? He said, he said to him, he talking to himself. It's a lot of self-talk going on in this, in this passage. He talking to himself. What should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. Then he said, I know. He talked to himself. I know. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I have room enough to store all my wheat and other goods. Let's hear him again. Let's hear him again. And I sit back and say to myself, he's doing all this talking to himself. My friend, you have enough store away for, ten, for, for years to come. Now take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. Watch this. With all of this talking to himself, all of this self-talk, he's only concerned about himself. Because the reason why your awareness is so low is that the only person you're consulting about how you ought to live life, how you ought to make decisions is yourself. You haven't talked to God about it. You haven't talked to no preacher about it. You haven't talked to no friends about it. No godly. You haven't, you haven't asked anybody for advice as to what it is that you ought to be doing with these important decisions that you're making in your life. And what I'm telling you today is that if you want to live a life where you're living every single day like it's your final play, you're going to have to start talking to more than just yourself. No man is an island. You can't get to where God is trying to take you by yourself. You need to be in an environment, in a community of people who will pour into you, who will encourage you, who will motivate you, who will rebuke you and tell you wrong, who will lift you up, who will pray for you, who will let you know everything is going to be all right when everything seems all wrong. This man only has conversations with himself. And when you are the only one that you are talking to, you're bound to have low or no self-awareness. If you're still with me, say yes. Yes. So now he gets this wake-up call, right? He gets this, this awakening, if you will, when Jesus says, but God said to him, you fool. You will die this very night. This is your final play, and you don't even know it. Right. It's about to be over with for you, and you don't even know it because you stuck on those material things that you're trying to build. Your low awareness has reduced your priorities. Your low awareness has, 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 has put you in a place where you, where you have not prioritized the most important thing in your life, which is your relationship with God. You fool. Now, when Jesus started calling people fools, Then he says, who will get everything you work for? You, do it, you did all that. Who's going to get all that you work for? You're about to die tonight. It's your final play. Right? Now watch this. Watch this. Watch this. So this is, this is, this is, this is, this is a word for you to, to, to raise or to live with a greater self-awareness, to live with a greater self-awareness, and you do that by not just talking to yourself, but by first and foremost talking to God. And inviting other people in your life to give you feedback, to help you to see uh, 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 areas that, 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 that you weren't aware of. Here's the here's second one. Here's the second one. The second one, guys, the second one is to live with greater urgency. To live with greater urgency. What do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? Well, the text said that you 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 about to die. I, I I've seen stories. I've come across stories where people who knew that they were getting ready to die, and they said, "You know what, man? I got this bucket list." In fact, they didn't even come up with the bucket list until they knew they were about to die. 
And so now they begin to live with a greater sense of uh, uh, they, 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 the, the pep in their step got a little bit faster. Right? They, they, they stopped procrastinating on things that they said they were going to do but never got around to doing it. So if you're going to live every day like it's your last, watch this, every day like it's the final play, you've got to live with a greater sense of urgency. You've got to be about your father's business. Let me, let me, let me get this text real quick. Watch this. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10. The Bible says, Wherever, whatever you do, do it with all your might. Because, watch this, watch this. When you go to the grave, this is a if. The Bible says, the living know that they will die. But the dead don't know nothing. So since the living know that we will die, and because uh, when you go to the grave, there will be no work, nor planning, or knowledge, or wisdom, God is saying, listen, I want you to live with a sense of urgency right now. Come on, there's some books in you that you haven't written yet, because you haven't been living with urgency. There are some folk that you haven't forgiven yet. Because you haven't been living with urgency. There are some things that you have put off and procrastinated on because you have not been living with urgency. And so God says to you today, listen, if you want to live every day like it's your final play, then you have to live with a sense of urgency. You have to live with a greater awareness. Here's my last point, and then we're done, guys. My last point, then we're done. Last one, then we're done. Watch this. Watch this. Here's the last one. Here's the last one. The third thing that we need to live with is we need to live with a greater relationship with God. After Jesus told a man, hey, you fool, you about to die tonight. Who going to, what's going to happen to all this stuff you accumulated? Right? Who going to take that? You about to die tonight. Watch this. Then, then, then Jesus said, then Jesus said, watch this. Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth. But have not ha- but but not have, I'm sorry, a rich relationship with God. That's the foolishness that Jesus is speaking about. It's foolish to focus on earthly wealth and have no relationship with God. So Jesus says the priority should be a rich relationship with God. There was a point in my time, point of time in my life where I had a poor relationship with God. Right. Anybody like being broke? No, I, don't, I haven't. I ain't met nobody who enjoy being broke. Now it's one thing to say that, right? But our behavior sometimes and how we spend money, what we do with the money that we get, says that we actually enjoy being poor. That's another sermon. All right. But there was a point of time in my life where I had a poor relationship with God, and that's because I didn't know God. I want to take y'all back uh, uh, to, 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 to B.C., Taurus Montgomery, B.C. That's before Christ. Right. I'm talking about a young man who, who uh, you know, I, 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 I believe that God had blessed me. I, I believe that I was gifted. I was talented. I had, uh, I, I had, you know, dreams and goals. But because my dreams and goals were not based on a relationship with God, they were still, they were poor dreams and goals. Because God was nowhere in the picture. Because I didn't have a, a, a clear understanding of God's purpose for my life, I had no clear understanding of what God was calling me to do. I was living in, hear me now, I was living in poverty, though I had a presentation of being rich. See, on the, same, on, 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 the same, on the image right here, you know, I got my bling bling on and uh, I'm at the club and I'm, I'm, I'm having a good time. But, 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 but the people at the club didn't know that the house that I live in, we didn't have water. The water was off and on. The electricity was off for nine months. The gas was off for two years. Rats and roaches were there like they paid rent. 
The things that I witnessed very early, hear me now, here's what, I, here's what I come to realize, guys. What I come to realize is that one of the things that affect, in fact, it, this is probably the most important thing, that affect our relationship with God more than anything else is how we were raised. When you experience childhood trauma, the people in your life, they begin to color what God looks like. So if you have an abusive father, if you have an abusive mother, it's hard for you to look at God and say, my father, which art in heaven. Because the term father in your mind, in your childhood experience, is a negative thing. And so sometimes we allow the circumstances that we were born in or the circumstances that we were reared in color the picture of what God looks like. And sometimes that, 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 that pit, you know, when, you know, when kids first start coloring, they all outside the line. And they bring it to you and you're looking at it and it's like, good job, son. Great, right? But as they get older, they start maturing, right? And, 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 they, and they learn how to color in the lines. And not only that, but they, they learn how to, how, to, how to just shade it in one specific way so that it, it, it's nice, it's clean, it's smooth. And then they show, you, and they show it to you now, and you're proud. You're showing off now. You, 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 you put it up on the refrigerator now. You're happy about it now. It's on the office in your wall. It's on the wall in your office now because your children have learned to color within the lines. And so here's what happened, uh, uh, brothers and sisters. What happened was Jesus came on the scene, and Jesus had this one specific purpose. He showed up. Watch this. He showed up in my situation with my house catching on fire. House catch on fire. Uh, we homeless now, no place to live, bounce around from one house to the next house, and this family let me and my family come and live with them. They happen to be Seventh-day Adventist Christians, and we start going to church. We start going to church because the church had a basketball team. You ain't hear what I said. We ain't just build no basketball court out there to play basketball. Church had a basketball team. You want to come, you want to play on the basketball team, you got to come to Sabbath school. And here's what was happening. What was happening was, what was happening was, uh, uh, God was showing me how to have a rich relationship with him. And Jesus comes on the scene now, and Jesus starts coloring inside the line. Jesus starts coloring a, a, a picture, a portrait of God that humanity had never seen before. Jesus starts saying, hey, this is what he looks like. You want to see what he looks like? Look at me. Look at how I treat people. Look at how I talk to people. Look at how I love on people. I'm talking about the people that the world considers to be outcasts, the people that the world has given up on, the people that the world has said, you are nobody, the people that the world calls the least of these. Jesus said, if you want, if you want to see what the Father looks like, I want you to look at me. Look, I need to wrap this thing up. I need to wrap this thing up. And I'm going to wrap this thing up by reminding you, watch this, saints of God, that, 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 that not only did Jesus have a rich relationship with God, but God wants to have a rich relationship with you. He wants to have a rich relationship with you. And so much so that when the game was on the line, as a matter of fact, when, when, when humanity was losing, you know humanity was losing because Adam turned the ball over. He turned the ball over. It was a turnover, and it got to the point. Hear me. Oh, help me, Jesus. It got to the point where Adam could never get the ball back. He could play the best defense. Oh, I wish I had a church with me this morning. He could play the best defense. I'm talking about he could get down and slap the floor and everything. Come on, bring it on. But there was no way that he would get the ball back from the devil because the devil was too powerful. And when the universe thought it was over, God said, I got a final play. I got a play that's going to blow y'all mind. What's the play? 
I'm going to send my son into the world as a human being. Not only that, but he's going to live in such a way that's going to show the world what love looks like, what grace looks like, what power looks like, what humility looks like. He's going to show the world how to forgive. And not just that, he's going to go to a cross and die for people. Hell, help me, Jesus. He's going to die for people who killed him. And when he dead, the devil going to look at it like it was a turnover. But God knows how to say the best for last. So while he thought it was a turnover, it was God's final play. And so Jesus got up out the grave. He resurrected, and he did so for you and me. This was God's ultimate final play. But I got news for you. He didn't stop there because the Bible says that one day Jesus is coming back. He will return for the people who have a rich relationship with him. Here is the question. The question is, do you have a rich relationship with God? Because God wants a rich relationship with you. Notice that it says he wants. It's his desire. You're always on his mind. Even when you're not thinking about him. The question is, do you have a rich relationship with God? If you want to. I've got some decision cards right here because somebody in the house of God today, could you help me pass these out? Somebody in the house of God today, somebody in the house of God today, listen, you heard the word of God today, you heard the word of God today, and today the spirit of God has been speaking to you, and you are at a point right now in your walk with God where you want to say to the Lord, God, this is my moment, and today I am choosing to begin a new relationship with you. If that's your desire today, just raise your hand. Just raise your hand. We've we, we got some cars coming around. We've got some cars coming around. If you need a pen or pencil, raise your hand. Raise your hand if you need something to write with. If you need something to write with. Listen, at the end of the day, folks, this is all that matters. This is all that matters. At the end of the day, this is all that matters. How well is your soul? Are you secure in Jesus Christ? Have you made that decision? And even if you're not sure, even, even, even if you're not sure, but you want to say, I want to learn more. I, I, I'm just interested in learning more about what does it mean to have a relationship with God. If you need something to write with, look, if you need something to write with, raise your hand, raise your hand, raise your hand. What's going to happen is as you fill this out, the offering plate is going to come around, and I'm asking you to place it inside of the offering plate. Place your response inside of the offering plate, and we'll take that up, and we'll be in contact with you. But somebody in the house of God today, listen, you've made up your mind. You've made up your mind. You've heard the voice of God speaking to you today, and you say, you say by the grace of God, I choose to follow Jesus and have a rich relationship with him. I will live with self-awareness, a greater self-awareness. I will live with a greater sense of urgency. If that is your desire, I invite you to stand with me today as we pray to close out our service, to close out our time together. If that's you right now, stand to your feet, stand to your feet, stand to your feet. Don't forget, make sure, please insert your card inside of the offering plate as it goes around. We're going to pray right now that God would bless us to this end. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we are grateful, we are thankful for the privilege and the opportunity to be in a rich relationship with you. Father, we realize and we recognize, oh God, that there have been times 
Well, our relationship with you has been in poverty. But on today, Lord, we choose you. And we choose to have a rich relationship with you. Father, you have been speaking to your people today. And Lord, somebody in this place right now really need to make a decision for you, Lord. Tomorrow is not promised. We only have today. We only have this moment. So, Father, I pray that we will not procrastinate with this decision, but that we will choose this day who we will serve. May every decision in this place be that we will serve the Lord. We love you, God. We thank you and we praise you. And we ask all of these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Let all the people of God who believe say amen, amen, and amen, and amen again. You may be seated. You may be seated in the presence of